Imagine finding a simple, life-saving truth, something so obvious it will eventually save countless millions of lives. Now imagine being ridiculed, hated, and systematically destroyed by the very people you were trying to help just because that truth challenged their ego or their wallets. That is the tragedy of premature truth. It sounds absurd, but history is full of brilliant minds who were rejected by their own establishment, labeled as alarmists or obsessives, and often suffered the ultimate price before their discoveries became global standards. We're not talking about flat earthers or conspiracy theorists here. We're talking about foundational science. Take Ignaz Semmelweis. In the 1840s, working in Vienna, he noticed something horrifying. Women were dying from childbed fever in the doctor's ward at rates of up to 18%, while the midwife's ward only saw 2 to 3% mortality. After careful observation, Semmelweis realized the chilling difference. The doctors routinely performed autopsies every morning before attending to births, while midwives did not. In 1847, he introduced a protocol, mandatory hand-washing with a chlorine solution before checking patients. The results were instantaneous. Death rates plummeted, matching the midwives' ward. But instead of praise, he faced immediate visceral ridicule and hostility. Leading doctors were deeply offended by the suggestion that their hands, the hands of educated men, were causing mass death. Without germ theory, which wouldn't arrive for decades, Semmelweis couldn't explain why his method worked, only that it did. The medical community dismissed his evidence as mere coincidence, labeled him obsessive, and actively ensured his career crumbled. He was eventually committed to an asylum, where he died two weeks later at age 47. His ultimate vindication only came decades later, pioneered by people like Pasteur and Lister. Hand washing, the simplest medical standard worldwide, cost Semmelweis everything. If Semmelweis's struggle was against medical ignorance and pride, Rachel Carson's fight was against cold, corporate power. Fast forward a century to the mid-20th century. Carson, a marine biologist, published Silent Spring in 1962, a scathing warning about the devastating widespread use of chemical pesticides, specifically DDT, on wildlife and human health. She meticulously documented how these toxins accumulated in animal tissues, entered the food chain, and caused massive ecological damage. She painted a terrifying picture a future where chemicals had killed the birds, leaving an eerie, unnatural silence across America, hence the title. The reaction from the chemical industry, notably Monsanto and Velsical Chemical, was swift, ruthless, and brutal. They launched an all-out war. Velsical threatened her publisher with legal action, while Monsanto published a dark parody called The Desolate Year, claiming that banning pesticides would lead to famine and disease. Critics didn't debate her science. They attacked her personally, dismissing her as a hysterical woman and an alarmist. What makes this deeply tragic is that while writing this landmark book, Carson was already fighting breast cancer. She died in April 1964, less than two years after publication but not before she saw the very start of her vindication. President Kennedy ordered an investigation into her claims, and their report largely confirmed everything she wrote. By 1972, DDT was banned in the United States, and her work directly influenced the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, and the foundation of the modern environmental movement. We now recognize her as a founder, but she paid for that truth with her peace and her reputation, facing down corporate giants alone while battling a terminal illness.
The next story involves a scientist who didn't even set out to save the world. He just wanted to weigh it. Meet Claire Patterson, an American geochemist. His primary goal in the mid-20th century was to accurately date the age of the Earth, a massive undertaking that required developing complex new laboratory techniques to measure tiny amounts of lead in ancient rocks. But his rock samples and eventually his environmental measurements revealed the disturbing anomaly. Modern humans had drastically, abnormally high concentrations of lead in their bodies, multiple times higher than pre-industrial humans. Patterson identified the culprit, tetraethyl lead, a chemical additive in gasoline that released tons of toxic lead into the air daily. This was a massive public health threat, proven to cause genetic damage and developmental issues. But just like Carson, Patterson's findings put him directly in the crosshairs of a powerful industrial behemoth, the lead in oil industries. The Ethel Corporation and other industry actors launched a fierce campaign to completely undermine his scientific credibility and discredit his research. They successfully blocked him from joining National Research Council committees on lead safety. They funded rival scientists to publicly dismiss his concerns as unfounded and exaggerated. This wasn't a debate about science. It was a campaign of industrial obstruction and character assassination designed to protect billions in profit. But Patterson was relentless. He persisted for decades, refining his research and advocating fiercely for regulation. His work eventually became undeniable, leading to the Clean Air Act and the gradual eventual removal of lead from gasoline starting in the 1970s. The result? Blood lead levels in Americans dropped by over 80%. He's now recognized not just for dating the Earth at 4.55 billion years old, but as a public health hero. But he spent his entire later career being fought tooth and nail by corporate lobbies that didn't care about the catastrophic harm they were inflicting on the population. Now let's talk about a doctor who took the phrase, put your money where your mouth is, a little too literally. In the early 1980s, Australian doctor Barry Marshall and his colleague Robin Warren observed small curved bacteria, later named Helicobacter pylori, in stomach biopsies from patients with ulcers and gastritis. This was revolutionary because medical textbooks had insisted for decades that the stomach was simply too acidic for any bacteria to survive. The established medical wisdom held that ulcers were caused by stress, spicy foods, or lifestyle issues, treatable only with expensive acid-blocking medications and restrictive diets. Marshall and Warren proposed a radically simple solution, antibiotics. The medical community's reaction? Overwhelming skepticism and immediate hostility. Specialists dismissed Marshall's presentations, insisting his findings were contamination or error. Gastroenterologists, whose entire careers and billions in pharmaceutical industry profits relied on the stress and acid theory, showed zero interest. Frustrated by the total lack of acceptance and unable to secure funding for animal models, Marshall decided on a drastic, absolutely insane step in 1984. He brewed a broth containing the H. pylori bacteria and drank it. Within days, he developed severe dastritis. He then cured himself with antibiotics, proving his own theory by using himself as the test subject. Even after this dramatic demonstration, acceptance was slow. It took until the early 1990s for major medical authorities to finally acknowledge the truth. In 2005, Marshall and Warren were finally awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine for their discovery. 
That moment of drinking the bacteria in desperation highlights a profound problem. Innovation often comes from lone, marginalized voices fighting systems that are slow, disorganized, or simply too invested in the status quo. The stories of Semmelweis, Carson, Patterson, and Marshall share a tragic, consistent thread. Their genius was measured not just by the truth they uncovered, but by the years of suffering they endured until the world caught up. They showed that the biggest mistake in history is often not a military blunder or a political miscalculation, but the collective human inability to accept a challenging new truth, especially when that truth confronts pride, established dogma, or corporate profit. Semmelweis died insane in an asylum. Carson faced vicious slander while fighting cancer. Patterson was blacklisted for fighting lead, and Marshall had to infect himself to prove his point. It took a war, a Nobel Prize, and decades of advocacy for them to finally be recognized as the heroes they truly were. So next time you wash your hands, remember the simple cost of being right too early. If you found this dive into historical injustice compelling, make sure you hit that like button, subscribe for more breakdowns of history's untold stories, and ring the notification bell so you don't miss the next one. We'll see you in the next video.